صلوات على محمد وال محمد Assalamu alaikum everybody and welcome to a, another week of the Baraka programs. Uh, inshallah this week we'll have another great program lined up for you all. Um, and for once we won't be having pizza at the end. Baraka returning to its roots inshallah. But um, we'll get to that at the end. But to begin with we'll be having brother Ali al-Musharafawi um, reading Surah Al-Rahman for us. So can we please welcome him with the last salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad.
Thank you, Brother Ali, for that beautiful Quran recitation. Now, inshallah, to be continuing with the theme of nature, which is present in Surah Al-Rahman, we'll be having a speech from our brother Nicholas um, on the on nature and contemplation. So, can we please welcome him with a loud salawat, ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Thank you very much uh, for coming tonight. Uh, this is about the weather. That's why I'm wearing my brother's jacket here. <laughs> uh, so thank you very much for coming. Um, so today, inshallah, we'll be talking about Islam, nature, and contemplation. I start with the usual disclaimer now. Uh, the first one is that I really want you, I encourage you to do your own research. This is just my own. This is just my own. Uh... Yeah? Okay, cool. um, so I'm saying, first disclaimer, as usual, is I really encourage you to do your own research. This is just me talking here. I don't present this as being the most complete, the most perfect, or the best analysis of this particular topic. Uh, so, really, I encourage you to do your own research on the topic. Although, Unfortunately, I've been a... Unfortunately, I don't think it would take you very long because there's not much written, unfortunately, <coughs> by Muslim scholars on this particular topic. Uh, and the second one is always good when you talk in public about this type of topics to explain kind of where you come from. So, the four sources of information which I use for this, or sources of inspiration, one is natural balaha, which is after the Quran the first Islamic book I've ever read, uh, read and also the reason why I'm Muslim now there, alhamdulillah. Um, the second one is lectured by Sheikh uh, Hakim Muad, the Dean of the Islamic Muslim College. The third one is basically my own <coughs> experiences on this spiritual journey. And the fourth one is my research in political economy and political theory, which is really my area of, um, of expertise. So here there will be two dimensions to the talk. We're going to start from the more theological, the more mystical dimension, and we slowly move to a more like social, ethical, political issues. Um, but there's really a connection between the two. So basically I'm going to try to give you also some practical dimension to this talk, it's not just about theory. Uh, that will be the more social uh, dimension and ethical dimension. So, um, I'll start by saying there's something different uh, with Islam. Here we live in a country which I guess most people are atheists, but like all Christian, it's probably uh, half and half. But most of the people who come from a Christian background, they have different belief systems. <coughs> and here I really want to emphasize the fact that Islam is different because it asks you to move really from A, belief, to understanding and realization. It asks you to basically not just have blind faith. This is written in the Quran or this is written in the Bible, therefore you need to believe. It really emphasizes the importance of certitude. The second one is that we don't believe that God is you know, far away in the sky somewhere or something like that. We believe that God is closer to us than a tribunal veil. Right? And for people here who believe Mark that we would do type of thing, that's the what I'm saying. Uh, but I'm saying that we do need to uh, realize that in Islam, closeness to God is something important. We can go, pray, and talk directly to God. We don't need to go through the clergy or something like that. We can talk directly to God. God is closer to us than our tribal event. And then finally, there's also the fact that in Islam, the world is not fallen. The world is beautiful. The world is sacred. And therefore, it is a sign for us to meditate and to think about uh, as much as we can. So, if Islam is all about a spiritual journey, taking us on the path, the whole idea of smooth, if you want to be a sadic, if you want to walk on that path, 
if you want to move towards certainty and closeness to God, you can ask basically where do I start? So where, where can you start? Basically it's by contemplating nature. And thank you to Brother Mohammed, he's not here this week, but last week, uh, two weeks ago, he gave me a great segue here because he was talking about how do we actually know God and he was emphasizing at the end of the lecture the contemplation of nature as a way for us to go close to God. So here we've got two different ayat uh, from the Quran. I will explain you the Arabic because of French accent. Um, so I'll say the first one, and to Allah belongs the east and the west. So wherever you turn, there's a place of Allah. Indeed, Allah is all-encompassing in all. That's the first ayat. Then I could have made a very long list of ayat with no point going through all of them, but there are a lot of ayat like this in the Quran. The second one is very interesting. We will show them our signs in the horizons and within themselves. Until it becomes clear to them that this is the truth. But this is not sufficient concerning your Lord that he is of the whole thing a witness. And here I really want you to uh, focus on the first sentence of that ayah. The idea that we have signs on the horizons. So it's really looking out, looking at the creation of God, looking to nature. And you have signs within yourself. And there's really a strong connection between the two. And most people start from the creation and then they turn into art. So it's contemplating on nature and then contemplating on your own self. Uh, so there's a really strong um, dimension of contemplation and the relationship between the external world, external world and the internal world. And when you get into a spiritual journey, you discover that the external world is just there to, as a first step, move inside, inward. Um, and again, there's that idea that uh, you need to do that until you reach certainty that this is the truth, al -haq. Um, so, reflection on uh, nature is all over the place in the Quran, in the scripture. So, it's, it's quite different from other world scriptures where the Quran basically, and here talk about natural balah as well, um, basically talks about astronomy, talks about biology, and biology talks about embryology, which is kind of strange to try to describe how you know, the fetus is formed, these kind of things. Zoology, botany, and it's all about the celebration of uh, life and beauty. And you've got, for example, in terms of zoology, if you go to natural balaha, you've got the, talking about the bat, talking about ants. Again, it's not something which is very common in, um, in world scriptures, but which is, again, showing that Islam is really strongly emphasizing the importance of thinking about nature, about the beauty of creation. But it's not really just about the scriptures, all right? It's not just an intellectual thing, it's also a practical thing. Um, the way Islam started, basically, is Prophet Muhammad wasalam, going to mountains as a time of retreat at night, and that's how everything in Islam started. Uh, Islam is not just, it's interesting that he didn't get, uh, didn't receive revelation walking in the bazaar, like doing shopping or something like that. So I was saying that uh, Islam, um, it's not just about the scriptures, it's also a practical way of life. And the way Islam started was with Prophet Muhammad wasalam, going to uh, a cave in the mountains. And you've got here a picture of, of that particular mountain. I really want you to try to picture this. I don't know if any of you has ever spent time in nature at night alone, but it's both magical and beautiful. You can look at the sky and see the stars and things like that. It's also a bit scary. <laughs> it's also a bit scary. So it's really that dimension of being amazed by the beauty of the creation, but also realizing your own vulner vulnerability. Realizing that basically anything could happen right now. It's, it feels kind of, even if you go to a place which is kind of safe, you kind of feel a bit scared. It feels a bit like dangerous, even if it's probably not. Um, this is actually a very ancient practice. It's not just in Islam, like it's, it's all over different uh, indigenous tribes. There's these types of rites of passage, um, that idea of initiation. Uh, and for Sufis, you've got that idea of Hawa, where you just basically uh, go for 40 days, like you see in the cell, where you just contemplate and these kind of things. 
So something which is very um, universal type of practice, going alone and really contemplating on the world and then turning in the world. Uh, it's even in the cinema, I don't know uh, if any of you are like Star Wars, <laughs> but basically uh, Luke Skywalker, Skywalker going to swamp and going in a dark cave and facing his arc enemy. So even in cinema before Disney kind of ruined the franchise, <laughs> um, well, it's also there in the cinema. So it's really something universal in literature, everything, that idea that you need to go out in the world, be alone, look at the world, and then return it inside. Um, and that relates to the fact that uh, this is something which is inside us. It's by the Arab called your fitra, right? And Islam is all about reconnecting ourselves to our inner nature. Another thing which is quite interesting about Islam is that our practices have remained the same for 14 centuries. I don't know many other religions which can claim the same. Uh, so the way we pray, yeah, different might have a very small differences between the way we pray, but it's basically, basically it has stayed the same for 40 centuries. So it's very, very ancient what we're doing on a daily basis. Our daily life is governed by the, the different, uh, you know, the moon for Ramadan. I know that sometimes, unfortunately, we have debates about, you know, when we should stop fasting, these kind of things. But the moon is really what is uh, guiding us in terms of when we decide when we start and we finish um, fasting. When we pray, it's also, you know, based on the sun. So it's really trying to reconnect us to, um, to these ancient practices as well. Fasting, also very ancient practice. That's something which basically human beings have been used for a very long time as well because in the past there was no fridge or anything like that. So sometimes you have to stay for a while without water, without eating, these kind of things. Um, so again, something which is really part of nature, something which is really hardwired in us. And this is why when we practice Islam, it feels good. Yeah, we drink Ramadan, we get hungry and things like that, but we, we feel there's something right about this, right? This is because it's reconnecting us to our inner nature. However, <laughs> our current society is not really helping us so much to reconnect to that internal nature. Uh, we suffer from what you could call a nature deficit disorder, uh, a sense of alienation. Alienation is that idea that you're not really yourself. Um, and it's really no wonder that so many people now are distracted. And when you're distracted from creation and from yourself, you're distracted from God. For example, if you, uh, you live in, let's say, Brunswick, and you work in the CBD, you can spend your whole day, like, get up, check through your phone for like 15 minutes, take a quick shower, maybe have breakfast, then go on tram, and you stay in the tram, and then you go to an office, and you enter a number in a spreadsheet for eight hours a day, go back on the same tram, go back home, watch TV. You spend the whole day, you haven't seen any, you haven't looked at the sky, you haven't seen anything, or anything alive for your whole day. Um, and unfortunately, I think that's the, uh, what most people experience on a day-to-day -day basis. The fact that you have that picture there, <coughs> Sorry. We've got a picture there which shows like a, a big issue as well is light pollution. So I was talking about how great it is to go out at night and look at the stars. Well, alhamdulillah, here it's a good place, a new place, you can actually do that. <laughs> but if you live closer to a city, because of light pollution, you can't actually see the stars very much. Um, and maybe that's one of the reasons why uh, there's so much atheism nowadays, because I remember as a kid, I was not a believer, but I remember I was 10 years old or something like that, like lying in the grass with a friend at night and looking at the stars. And, and even if you're an unbeliever, you still have some kind of metaphysical discussion about the meaning of life and these kind of things. So maybe there's a parallel there. Fireflies, for example. Please raise your hand if you've ever, ever seen fireflies, or not in a Disney movie or something like that in nature. One, two, okay. That's just sad. <laughs> Uh, it's not your fault uh, because they can because of you know uh, pesticide and things like that. They're actually dying a lot, uh, but that's some kind of magical experience which we don't um, experience very often, unfortunately. Um, so again, maybe that's the reason why there's so much atheism. You can't really see you know, the beauty of God, but it's definitely a reason why there's so much depression. Uh, I know some of you here study psychology, these kind of things. Um, that idea of a deficit syndrome that idea is like actually something which some people for example in jail they're trying to rehabilitate inmates by putting them like walking together and 
garden, putting them in touch with animals in this garden, because it actually improves uh, people's behaviors. Uh, there's a website called research.childrenandnature.org, which basically summarizes and compiles all different uh, academic research on the relationship between uh, nature and mental health, uh, which is quite interesting. So it's proper academic research, not, not like some kind of PP website or whatnot. It's good research. Um, and so I think this is why uh, it's important for Muslims to turn back to nature. Uh, uh, read a quote from the book, which we will read at the book club. <laughs> uh, so that's by um, Sheikh Abdul Hayyum traveling home. The city dweller's perception of ubiquitous ugliness hardens the heart, which in turn renders the perception of beauty more difficult, creating a psychological trap or a vicious circle. Beauty is hardly to be found in a laptop or iPhone. It is to be intuited in the heart by confronting it personally, ideally in virgin nature, as the Quran recommends. The urbanization of the world and the desolation uh, even of traditional cities, symbolized in its most extreme form by the doomsday clock in Mecca. I don't have a brother in Mecca right now, <laughs> uh, so you can tell us about it when it comes back. Cuts the soul off from this healing. So, I'll read the whole page, but the whole page is actually quite interesting. So, even for Muslim, it's very important that to reconnect to nature. Even when you go to Mecca, just, just I haven't been there, uh, but it's pretty artificial, uh, which is quite problematic if we think that actually contemplating nature uh, helps us to get closer to God. There's also the animal kill kingdom. Um, so Islam is not like, um, for example, uh, René Descartes, the philosopher, he used to believe that animals were like machines. So if you start digging in the brain of a monkey and the monkey is screaming, that's just like if you, I don't know, use a screw into a, into a clock and it makes noises, the metal, things like that. So you've got that idea that animals are just machines, which may explain the way uh, animals have been treated quite badly in the West for a long time. But you, here you've got the opposite in the Quran. The Quran, the Quran actually tells us that uh, animals are actually communities like us. Use the word ummah, uh, plural, actually, ummah. Uh, and there's no creature on the earth or bird that flies with its wings except that they are communities like you. They have not neglected in the register a thing. Then unto their Lord they will be gathered. So it's not just things that just are pretty and then die and they just rot there. They actually a form of community as well. They have their own way of worshipping. Um, and this actually has very strong ethical implication for us as Muslims, I would say. So the issues of like deforestation, meat and dairy consumption, all of these kinds are actually something which we need to think about. When you look at modern chicken farms, for example, even the halal ones, halal, so it looks like concentration can for animals, basically, for other communities. Um, and I don't think that, as Muslim, we should think that this is uh, acceptable. So maybe you can share it after, but it's actually like, it is possible to get organic grass-fed uh, meat. It's a bit more expensive, but then again, we don't eat too much meat anyway. It's called cherry farm organic. I don't receive money from them. I'm not the same to do. Uh, they're not a sponsor. Uh, but if you want, we can uh, send the link uh, later if you want to make uh, your halal meat consumption uh, maybe more ethical. So there's a recognition in the Quran that biodiversity is a good thing, right? Animals do suffer, and they are all ayat, they're all signs of God. However, there's a current um, biodiversity crisis. I'll just read here. So some facts. Unfortunately, the list could have, could have taken the whole night to just go through the list. Um, the world has seen an average 16, uh, 68 drop in mammals, birds, fish, reptile, and amphibian population since 1970. In 1930, as many as 10 million uh, wild elephants roamed huge swaths of the African continent. Today, there are just 415,000 elephants across Africa. Fewer than 600 Sumatran tigers are estimated to remain in the wild. The koala population dropped a reported 30% from 2018 to 2021. More than 40% of insect species are declining, and a third are endangered. 
the rate of extinction is eight times faster than that of mammals, birds, and reptiles. The total mass of instinct, uh, insect is uh, falling by a precipitous 2.5% a year, according to the best data available, suggesting they could vanish within a century. This is actually quite important because insects are not just eye out of God, they're not just, yeah, things which sometimes you want to squish when they're inside our houses and things like that. They're actually important for like pollinization. And they go from plant to plant, so that's where like we get fruits and things like that. If we don't have bees anymore, and by the way, there's, you know, bees is very important in Quran, uh, we're quite in trouble in terms of food supply in this kind of things. So when you think about pesticides and this kind of things, it's, it has very strong uh, ethical implications again. Um, so really that what I want people to realize is that the loss of biodiversity is almost like a sacrilege. It's not, it's not okay, <laughs> because the Quran tells us that we need to look at all these sites, all these amazing creatures. So if you know, all of these creatures die, it's just not great. It's, even you don't need to be Muslim to think that, but from a Muslim perspective, it's not great. So why is this happening? Well, basically, the main reason why this is happening is because of consumerism. Um, so consumerism is the main reason why there's such an environmental threat. Uh, here, so on the slide, you've got Earth Overshoot Day. So it's the, it's the day, basically, you start using all the resources on the Earth which cannot be replaced. Uh, I guess if the scientist was here, he would say that's a very basic explanation, but you get it. Um, you can see, uh, does it? bit of a jump here, I guess it's because of COVID two years ago, but basically every single year uh, that day comes uh, closer and closer and closer. Um, and that's definitely um, a big issue, and that's why there's problems like climate change and the fact that there's such a, a decline in biodiversity, which again is problematic. So there's a relationship between and the current environmental threat, and the current environmental threat is a problem from an Islamic perspective because of all the reasons which I've mentioned earlier. What does Islam say, however, about uh, consumerism? Uh, so I read one ayat, uh, sorry, one ayat from the Quran, and I read something from Najib Baraha. So the Quran, uh, so that's uh, Surah Al-Hadid, verse 20. Know that the life of this world is but amusement and diversion and adornment, and boasting to one another, and competition and increase of wealth and children. And there's a book there which is really interesting, which shows that people, if they can choose between having more money but it's equal, or they have less money but they have more than the others, they actually choose this study which was made at Harvard, Harvard University. They prefer to have less money, but if it's still more than the others, they still prefer that. So it's related to this, this ayat. Um, so increase in wealth and children, like the example of a rain whose resulting plant growth, uh, I won't read the rest, but the first part you get it. There's also in um, Surah Al-Fajr, verse uh, 20, actually it's through the whole Surah, you've got on one hand the idea that you love wealth with uh, great love, at the beginning of the Surah, and that's kind of opposed to the idea of inner peace, so nafsul mutma'ina. So you've got really a strong tension that's linking back to mental health between Consumerism and inner peace. Um, in Najul Balaha, I read, for example, there's a, one about all the different prophets. So, for example, the example of uh, Prophet Isa, alayhi salam. If you desire, there's Imam Ali, alayhi salam, talking. If you desire, I will tell you about Isa, alayhi salam, son of Maryam, alayhi salam. And he used a stone for his pillow, put on coarse coarse uh, clothes and ate rough food. His condiment was hunger. His lamp at night was the, uh, the moon. His shade during the winter was just um, the expense of earth eastward, eastward and westward. His fruits and flowers were only what grows from the earth for the cattle. He had no wife to allure him, nor any son to grief, uh, give grief. No wealth to deviate his attention, nor greed to disgrace him. His two feet were his com convenience, convenience? <laughs> and his two hands his servants. And then there's something about the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, the fact that he was uh, basically repairing his own clothes, repairing his own uh, sandals. And um, just a quote as well from the introduction to Nahjur Balaha. Uh, oh, there you go. 
So here it's an uh, introduction to Najul Barahat, so it's Ayatollah uh, Muhtada Mutari here. Imam Ali alayhi salam, the most free of all the world's free men. He was, uh, he was a free man in the complete sense of the world, because he was a Zahid, so it's like someone who has citizen, I think is the word for Zahid, Finnish, in the most profound sense of the world. Ali alayhi salam, in Najul Barahat, there's great emphasis on renunciation of world pleasures and comfort as a means of liberation. In one of the hikam, he says the following, quote, greed is everlasting slavery. So, we see that consumerism is quite a big issue, both from an ethical environment perspective, but also it's a problem from a mental health perspective. And now we just have these things, and of course, you know, Islam is about balance, I'm not telling you that you should uh, go sell your house and your car and go live in a cave somewhere in the Dendong Range or something like that. It's all about balance, but I think we need all of us to look at ourselves in the mirror and try to see if we got that balance right, I guess. Um, so, I was talking about um, consumerism. What you need to understand is that most of the choices you make as a consumer are not free choices. You've got people who are hired and get pretty good salaries to make you buy stuff. They study you know, the way your brain works, the neurochemicals, like dopamine and stuff like that to make you buy stuff. So whatever you do, whatever you buy, unless it's like you know, the basic essentials, Usually it's not, uh, you don't do that out of your free will, as you might think. So I read, read something, it comes from um, a book, it's called The Coming Insurrection, the, from the, by the Invisible Committee. And it's going to show you that consumerism is a high problem in terms of reconnecting to your fitra, to your inner nature. So I'm quoting here. I am what I am. This is marketing's latest offering to the world the final stage in development of advertising. Far beyond all the exhortation to be different, to be oneself and to drink Pepsi. Decades of concept in order to get where we are, to arrive at pure tautology, I equal I. I am what I am. My, belong my body belongs to me. I am me, you are you, and something's wrong. Mass personalization, individualization of all conditions, life, work, and misery. Diffuse schizophrenia, rampant depression, atomization into fine paranoid particles, historization of contact. The more I want to be me, the more I feel an emptiness. The more I express myself, the more I'm drained. The more I run after myself, the more tired I get. We treat ourselves like boring box office. We've become our own representatives in a strange commerce, current tones of a personalization that feels, in the end, a lot more like an amputation. Meanwhile, I manage the quest for a self, my love, my apartment, the latest fashionable, um, fashionable stuff, I'm changing the world here, um, relationship dramas. Whatever process is, is, it takes to hold on to an eye. If society hadn't become such a definitive abstraction, then it would denote all the existential crutches that allow me to keep dragging on the ensemble of dependencies I've contracted as a price of my identity. I am what I am. Never has domination found such an innocent sounding slogan. The maintenance of the self in a permanent state of deterioration, in a chronic state of near collapse, is the best kept secret of the present order of things. The weak, depressed, self-critical, virtual self is essentially that endlessly adaptable subject required by the ceaseless innovation of production, the accelerated obsolescence of technologies, the constant overturning of social norms, and generalized flexibility. It is at the same time the most voracious consumer, and paradoxically, the most productive self, the one that will most eagerly and energetically throw itself into the slightest, slightest project, only to turn later to its original larval state. It's dizzy to see rebooks, uh, re I am what I am, and throw on the top of a guy scraper. The West everywhere rolls out its favorite Trojan horse, 
the exasperating antinomy between the self and the world, the individual and the group, between attachment and freedom. I am what I am that is not simply a lie, a simple advertising campaign, but a military campaign, a war cry directed against everything that exists between beings, against everything that circulates instinctive, indistinctively, indistinctly. Everything that, it, that, is, uh, that invisibly links them, everything that prevents complete desolation against everything that makes us exist, and ensures that the whole world doesn't everywhere have the look and feel of a highway, an amusement park, a new town. Pure boredom, passionless but well ordered, empty, frozen space, where nothing moves apart from registered bodies, mole molecular automobiles, and ideal commodities. So the reason why I've read this uh, rather long um, part of the text is because basically I am what I am. This ideology is the opposite of the Islamic ethos. In Islam, it's not I am what I am, I do whatever I want. In Islam, it's the whole purpose is actually to get rid of that. However, advertising, social media to a large extent nowadays, is all about the celebration of the self. Everything you buy is to give you like an identity. And Islam is all, it's not about celebrating the self, it's all about actually uh, going away from the self, to the nafs. Uh, and as I said, the current ideology, what you buy in things like reinforces your I, your self. Um, and so you can oh, think about this <laughs> uh, whenever you are going to a shopping mall or something like that, try to really emphasize the fact that this is not trying to drive you back to God at all. It's trying to take you away from God. And what's really interesting about all of this is that a lot of people in the West actually realize that there's something really wrong with the current society. People don't really feel happy spending hours in a shopping mall, spending hours uh, you know, in front of a computer every day. People do feel that sense of alienation. Right? That's why there's so much problem with people. I know that Muslims like to complain about how hard it is to live in the West, but it's hard for people in the West, Western people, to live in the West as well. It's not easy. There's so many problems. People are not sure about their identity. People are not sure about genders. Uh, people are not sure about anything. You just spend hours on the phone and things like that. And that's why some people, uh, they try to reconnect to nature. And that's why it's really interesting that there's quite a growth in uh, Western culture to go back to neo-pagan, so it's like neo-paganism. So this is like the Beltane uh, Festival. I think it's in Scotland or Ireland, but I think it's Scotland. Um, and basically it's people in spring celebrating nature and things like that. And it's, that's one big, uh, big one. The one is uh, what we could call like Western Buddhism. So it's like people, you know, going, uh, walking like 10 hours a day uh, as traders in Wall Street and then going for a Zen class. Uh, after that, and buying Lululemon clothing, going on the yoga mat, and you know, thinking that they're going to find peace uh, at the same time. And then, on the Friday evening, they're still going to go uh, see their shrink and spend like 150 or I don't know how much it costs, 200 dollars, to talk about how bad they feel. So it's just that because all of these things they're not real, neo-paganism and Western Buddhism thing. Buddhism as such is quite an interesting uh, path, but like you know that Western approach to Buddhism, which is all about again celebrating the self. That's why it doesn't work basically. Um, and unfortunately, I think a lot of people turn to us this type of things <laughs> because us as Muslim, we're not very good at talking about our faith. Uh, we're not really good at showing everything which we're talking about. Yes, we have an answer to consumerism. Yes, we have an answer to mental health issues. Yes, we have an answer to climate change and environmental destruction. And now this. So, yeah, we, we shouldn't be seen as people who just focus on, I don't know, uh, let's say something not too controversial, like which part of a uh, woman's feet can be seen in public and debate about that. We should be seen as people who actually go out there, go in the world, show that our face is like actually a way of saving humanity. And that's why, unfortunately, we don't do that very well because people turn to uh, weird uh, uh, torch burning type of faith nowadays. And it's also like, there's a problem is that as Muslims, we're not very good at engaging with Western thought. 
We're not very good at engaging with uh, political economy. So there's Mohammed Bakir Sadr, for example, he wrote a, a really interesting book about our economy, so the idea that you know, there's such a thing as Islamic economy. However, it's quite dated, no? It's really emphasizing, like, uh, focusing on um, capitalism versus communism, and we kind of moved past that, no? Not really good. If we, uh, if we actually have a look at an Islamic perspective on um, political economy, there's two things which are worth mentioning. The first one is the degrowth movement. So it's the idea that we should stop thinking about the GDP as the thing which we need to increase each year for improving uh, the well-being of our people. So degrowth is the idea that actually we would be much happier if we work three days a week instead of five, even if that means consuming less. That's one uh, aspect. And then there's uh, Georgism as well, if you want to read uh, Progress in Poverty, which is all about the tax system and how uh, basically we should really be not taxing people on their income and their consumption, but taxing natural resources and land instead. Um, so again, because we're not very good at this, there's actually a very strong link between political economy, Western political economy and Muslims, again, because of our tax system and things like that, we have something interesting to say to make sure that um, things are fairer and better for the environment, at least. So, I'm kind of running out of time, so. What does this mean? I said there would be some kind of uh, practical thing at the end. Well, it means that we kind of, I mean, unless, if you actually, if everything I just said uh, made sense for you for a very long time and you actually spend a lot of time in nature and things like that, please come and see me after the lecture. I'm sure we get along well. <laughs> but I think for most of us, um, we really need to review our lifestyle. We need to review the way we approach Islam. We need to revive that tradition of tafakkur, of like contemplation, and try to see the world with different eyes. What does it mean in practice? Uh, I don't know, you can, uh, instead of hanging with your mate at Starbucks or something like that, you can just go and sit in the park. You know, you're gonna save money actually, uh, but again, it's not something which is really encouraged. Um, you can make sure that maybe we uh, spend more time in nature than for praying. Okay, nothing wrong with praying in the park. We've done that actually with an English program uh, not long ago. Uh, so pray in nature. If you have a balcony, pray on your balcony. Look actually at the sky at night before your matinee or Isha prayer. It's really amazing. Um, maybe rethink the way you consume. Maybe when you buy something, think about how much it costs and think, okay, so I make this much an hour. Could I spend these hours with I don't know, my kids, or spending time in nature, or maybe doing some extra prayer? So try thinking that way as well uh, when you consume and when you buy things. Understand that in many cases, and again, I'm talking about your food and clothing and stuff like that, but in a lot of cases, what we buy, it's not really, uh, it doesn't make us happier. And that's, again, don't have time to read a quote, but there's this book, uh, The Hacking of the American Mind, The Science Behind the Corporate Takeover of Our Bodies and Brains which if you're interested, read that, and you see that it's basically people manipulating you and doesn't make you happy. And there's actually a correlation, it's really interesting, uh, which shows that people, this is in US dollars, you make, like, basically your happiness increase until you make $75,000, and it starts decreasing. But it's US dollars, so maybe it's here, it'll be you know, the exchange rate, 110 or something like that, and then it starts decreasing. And when you have a look at, like, you've got different indices, so you've got the GDP, that's the mainstream one, but you have indices of happiness. It shows that countries such as Venezuela, for example, which is not great economically, people are much happier than say like Japan, which has super high uh, rates of suicide and things like that. Which shows that really things does not really uh, bring happiness at all. Uh, there's really a strong difference between pleasure and happiness, let's say. Uh, so yeah, we try to approach Islam in a different manner, try to feel closer to God, try to be happy also in your Islam, you know, it's also about being happy, all of these kind of things. Um, and means, again, maybe, you know, I know that there's such thing as halal KFC, um, but have a look at, you know, what happens in um, yeah, factory farming, and then make your uh, own educated uh, choices, I guess. Uh, so yeah, make sure that you don't spend too much time um, shopping malls and things like that, it's just not good for you, it's not gonna get you closer to God. And if we do this, if we make all of these changes, and we're all on journey, it's all about suluk, about that travel towards God, we get closer to nature, 
we engage with Western philosophy, we understand the evils of this society, which is all about the I, the self, you know, buy more stuff that you can post on Instagram and people can give you more likes and things like that, doesn't make you happier. Well, Muslims will have a much better way of interacting with non-Muslims. We can talk about Muslims, and that's in the book which we'll read as well, Muslims as therapists. Muslims as showing the light of our deen. I know deen is not a boring thing that when you pray five times a day, and no, it's great, it should make you happy, it should make you happy. You should feel free. It gives you a compass in society. It gives, as I said, it gives solution to so many problems in this current society. Now go talk to people who are not Muslim and talk about these things. Talk about how you actually care about animals because it's in the Quran and things like that. And talk about all these things. Don't say, oh, I'm Muslim uh, and I read this in the Quran. And just just try, try to approach this in a universal manner. Um, so, yeah, as I said, it's kind of hard to live in the West, I guess, for some Muslims. But maybe we can perceive ourselves actually as people who have been thrown or cast or grown up in the West to actually help society, help people. Um, so it's just trying to uh, revise our role uh, and see how we can actually help society. And that's it for me today, exactly 40 minutes, as I said. Uh, literature on the topic, as I said, unfortunately, not much written. Uh, there's a cool documentary, because I know it's a lot of young people, they don't like reading, so it's pretty easier, but there's a, a documentary, it's called The Century of the Self by uh, Adam Curtis, which shows how uh, Bernays, so it was Freud's nephew, basically use uh, the theory, like psychology and things like that, to make people buy stuff. Like, I don't give details, but the way people started smoking, for example, is pretty crazy. Um, so yeah, we've got a whole bunch of books, again, not many from uh, Muslim uh, scholars, because unfortunately it's not something uh, is discussed very often by Muslims. So thank you very much for coming. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Thank you, Brother Nicholas, for that very uh, insightful talk on nature and contemplation in Islam. Um, inshallah, we'll be able to reflect, as you mentioned, on our daily activities, with how we interact with nature, um, and then again, of course, consumerism, um, so that we can gain closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, just a couple of announcements before our interactive segment. Uh, first of all, again, with Brother Nicholas, we'll be starting the book club in approximately two and a half weeks. Um, and there's still a few days where people can register for that, so if you're interested with that, you can either talk to um, Brother Nicholas on the men's side, or Fatima Zareb on the women's side, and um, yeah, if you're interested in that, um, have a chat to them. And the only other thing is there's a small white Suzuki parked outside with the number plate 1UM2RS. Um, your lights are on, so um, don't want your battery to die on the way home. So um, if you want to go address that, that'd be good. Um, other than that, uh, I'd like to introduce Fatima Zareb and Sara Salah uh, to begin our interactive segment with Adad Salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. The passage of time. You know that you are drowning when your dreams mix with your reality. When you realize your memories aren't real, but they are just a figment your brain created of the reality that you have experienced. The absence of past and the anticipation of the future seems to blind us from the present from the fact that we are a constant in the passage of time, that we can never hold on to anything that took place in our lives, but only the feeling it brings within us. You begin to hold the present close when you find that some people are no longer there, as they choose to dwell in the past or guess the future. Both do not enrich circumstances or fulfillment that is desired. The realm in which most humans live is the one of loud chatter, that clutters your skull and intoxicates your thoughts. With poison that prayer is designed to wring out. In the depths of your paths, you will find orchids that bloom in your gulps. With petals that well up to your throat and vines that restrict your lungs. 
Your words will run dry as you have no oxygen to speak. Where then will you lay as you weep? Caught up so intensely in time for you then to be blind. The minuscule mis sorry, the minuscule mysteries that we dwell do not serve us assistance from the strings of hell. Although the umbilical cord that pulls you back is the act of prayer, the act of which submerges your soul into peace. Prayer is what brings you to the present, allowing you to swallow the past and entrust the future. Prayer is what heals your lungs when they are desperate for air, after crying out blood that wells in your being. Prayer, where you realize at the end of the day, it is you alone who will stand before your Lord and answer. Because if you cannot fulfill the promise that you gave to your Lord when sent down to this dunya, then what purpose are you to achieve in the vines of time? Salawat. Okay, now we will be commencing the short segment. Um, we will have six groups, three on the women's side and three on the women, um, men, women's and men's side. Um, and in those groups, we will uh, have one uh, member of the Baraka team to, that you can ask questions to, um, because you'll be given an unknown person, which will uh, be in a man. Um, so yeah, uh, if the Baraka team can separate you guys, and we'll just begin. Follow up. The questions are yes and no questions, so the Baraka member can only answer with yes or no. Um, the person is a um, either a prophet or an imam, and you got first per, um, group to guess this person was. Okay, so good luck. <laughs> 